Hey, and viewership, if you're enjoying this content because you haven't had a clear call to action in a couple of episodes, like, share, subscribe, go back into our back catalogue, watch our Prince of Persia series because, like, at times it's frustrating. We think we get some really, really good content out of what is a very old and very flawed game. Like, I, I would go on record as calling Warrior Within a flawed masterpiece. I think that's fair. I love Warrior Within. Yeah. Would you say it's a flawed masterpiece? I'd say it's a wonderful game. You. So why didn't you play it out of interest? And I know so the I'm answer. not good enough. And is it because it's a game that doesn't do difficulty curves well? It's a very difficult game. I have finished the whole game, which tells you it can't be that bad. I had issues with fighting the crow guy. I think there was an issue with my controller, and I lacked damn the... Damn tools. Yeah, damn tools, and I lacked the, the patience. Um, was so, touche. But if you want to see me playing the, quite frankly, best tower defense game ever made, we have done Plants vs. Zombies, and it's on the channel. Yeah, that's true. That, that, I really like this as a kind of proto-tower defense game. Yeah. Not entirely far, far cry from what medieval warfare probably was in some ways, yes. Yeah, Wait, I mean, no, oh. we, have, we haven't really gone into this, but like the notion of a pitched battle in medieval warfare is so rare because, frankly, the economic risk is yeah. absolutely like, all I'm paramount. Doing, all I'm doing here, which is probably pretty accurate, is I'm fighting off being besieged. Like, these forces yeah. are coming in, and the first thing they're doing is they're picking off my hop farmers and my grain farmers. And... Well, wheat farmers, and that will really piss me off because what I'm trying to do here is is to gather um, ale. So I just want to stop them from harming my economic production. Rather, I'm not concerned about these troops actually meaningfully attacking and killing the lord, but harming my my productivity. They're trying to hit yep. me right in the GDP. That, that's how you do it because, like, let's face it, like the notion of building, constructing, and then utilizing heavy siege engines to make a hole in the wall to actually crush a meaningful walled defense of a castle or like fortification is really difficult. Yeah. You've got to have a skilled engineer on hand and at a time in 1066 when like you haven't even mastered stone buildings yet, how rare are those people, right? Yeah. I mean, do, do you even, do you have one of those in your kingdom? If you do, like, where is he? This like, is, I, should, even... I should point out as well, because we've not, I've, I've been doing it, but we haven't really seen, this is a phenomenon we've not really seen. Certain things, farms especially, so wheat and hops, can only be grown on the lowlands. So all of these yellow higher lands here, I cannot build any farms in, hence it's red. I can basically just I can maybe fit one down there, but probably not. So I've pretty much got this little swath of low-lying valley is pretty much the only place that I can build that, but also you can't build defences too far out from your keep. Uh, so I can't start building there. Except, oh, oh, I can apparently. Well, there we go. <laughs> uh, that was a bad example, but yeah, obviously the further out you get, the further you get away from your stockpile and your keep and whatnot. Yeah, so you've got, yeah. I have this valley to defend that I can't really reinforce as much as I'd perhaps like. But that's exactly how historical fortifications yeah. work. Yeah. It's like, do you occupy the defensible highlands where it's hard to scratch a living? Yeah, again, so, so, or do you occupy the vulnerable lowlands? I heard this mentioned in a podcast surrounded. recently where, was, where they were talking about like a castle in like well, it was like a, fort a a defensible position in like the marshes near Cambridge, basically that was like unassailable. It was like, yeah, but it's unassailable, but it's also shit because you have to live there, and it's unassailable because you can't fucking move or do anything, and it's an awful existence to just sit there, basically. Yeah, so you, like traditionally you build very strong castles on top of like crags or rocks. Edinburgh outcrops. Castle being the classic example. I was going to say Edinburgh Castle like, never known to fall to enemy soldiers. You've actually like stolen the words from my very mouth, Doctor. I was going to I was going to point to Edinburgh Castle and Stirling Castle, both of which are built on like rocky yeah. crags. But like you can't grow shit on rocky crags. Yeah. right? that's what you get I mean, guns like, for. Yeah, but but they are but they are unassailable. Like you you cannot assault a castle which is already at like a two hundred foot elevation above the ground. Because like if you're a guy with a sword carrying your sword and armor up the two hundred feet, like what do you do when you get there? Like if you, even if you got a ladder, you got to climb that. Yeah, Edinburgh Castle is one of my favorites just because it's a type of formation, a geological formation that you get a lot of castles on around the world. Yeah, it's called a crag and tail. So it's basically hard rock that's been eroded by glaciers moving past it. But basically the glacier is forced to pass around hard rock and then rejoins on the other side, but can't... If you imagine, like, water flowing around, like, if you stick a stick in a river, water flows around it and kind of joins behind it, but it leaves a bit of a depression behind where the stick is. Yeah. And so you get these crag and tails where you basically got an unassailable rocky pinnacle, but all it has is one very slow, gentle approach to it. In Edinburgh's case, what we now call the Royal Mile. Yeah. That basically means Edinburgh you just have to very slowly walk up it. 
That's very Edinburgh cool. has had very a cool. castle. Very we have no that. idea how old Edinburgh Castle is. The oldest records say there's been a castle there as long as anyone can remember. <laughs> so there's a really cool, and it is a legend because it's, it's clearly historical nonsense. But like, there's a large hill viewership that oversees the town oh, of Edinburgh. Oh, is this going to be Edinburgh, Archer's, Arthur's seat? seat. Arthur's seat. No, I don't Arthur's know. seat. No. Some people so there's this big hill called Arthur's Seat that overlooks Edinburgh, and no one knows why it's called Arthur's Seat. It doesn't seem to have any link to King Arthur. A lot of people well, say that it's linked that it's a corruption of Archer's Seat, because it's where you'd shoot at people from, but that's complete bollocks. Well, I I did read I, I don't think this is true. We're now into the territory of myth and speculation, but like I did read that like it's called Arthur's Seat because this was the furthest north that Arthur, the historical King Arthur, mythical King Arthur, got in the UK. And he took one look at the Scots from atop Arthur's seat and thought, nah, <laughs> gonna go back to Camelot. Well, I think for, first, <laughs> first off, talking about anything historical in the context of King Arthur is dangerous. Especially because... if you're using the word Camelot, which appeared 600 years after he lived. Well, that was, yeah, that was yeah. Jeff, not Jeffrey of Monmouth. Uh, ooh, the French guy who did the Arthur stuff. Yeah. Mallory, Thomas Mallory. Le- yeah. Thomas Mallory, Thomas Mallory is English, so like Mallory's account. Yeah, well, yeah but he's right, he wrote in French, though, so Le Mort d'Arthur, which is definitely in French. <laughs> which, I, which I have read, and is it like, you can get it free on Kindle viewship and online it's a wonderful bit of fiction my, my favourite bit of this is watch it reading hev- the Warlord Chronicles heavily romanced uh, rom- oh yeah yeah, yeah. Like, it's, like, it's even, a reason that that's even, why all the fucking uh, all our like night, a lot of that chivalry kind of shit comes from that type of yeah and it and it is Arthur it is fiction. nonsense so like the, the, the notion of Arthur he's maybe like 4th 5th century so like he's <laughs> In Roman Britain at that time, there is no historical record keeping. We don't know what was going on. There, there are various historical accounts of who might have been Arthur, but he, he didn't exist in the context we expect him to exist. But it's a great story. And like Thomas Mallory writes some incredible fiction about Arthur. My personal favourite is the, the tale of Lancelot, who goes questing and does a bunch of impossible, amazing, knightly things that only Lancelot can do. And comes back and bangs his wife. Uh, well, he comes back and like he falls in love with Guinevere. I, I think it, it's uncouth to say that he bangs Guinevere. <laughs> they, they have a deep and complex love affair against God and man and their patriarch Arthur. But anyway, there's a wonderful story about Lancelot questing in what I think is Wales, but I could be wrong about this, where a dragon seizes Lancelot in its clutches and like a python wraps around him and like he's going to be crushed to death and the dragon's ready to kill him and Lancelot reaches down into the dragon's throat, pulls out the dragon's heart from its like beating chest, stabs the dragon's heart in front of it and that kills it. And like this is this is the level of like medieval absurdity that you're dealing with with Mallory. I love yeah, it. Fair. Well, we've nearly fin- finished this mission. We need 20 and we've got 19. I think the snake does alter the deal again, though. And he's like, oh, it's it, been a tough pr- winter. W- would you pray he doesn't <laughs> alter it further? <laughs> yeah. Can I, I know the sprite's going to disagree with this, but we did say we would eventually get to Arthur. So th- there is a historical case that Arthur is, in fact, the last Roman centurion in Britain. So... In the 4th, 5th century, the Romans have withdrawn. Basically, the Roman Empire in the West is starting to retract a little bit. And Arthur is like a Roman patrician or nobleman, centurion, whatever you want to call him, a Roman commander who is left in the British Isles with Roman auxiliaries and some other Roman soldiers. And he is the last line of defense against the Angles and the Saxons who will eventually colonize the British Isles. So, like, he is Arturius, that would be his Roman name, and that the knights, quote-unquote, he commands, are not actually knights in the conventional sense, with plate armour and chainmail and all the stuff we would understand, but they are what's thought of as Sarmatian heavy horsemen. So, there are a group of people in the Far East, in the Middle East, Anatolia, Turkey, called the Sarmatians. They are a conquered people that the Romans smash, so they are famous for their heavy cavalry. They feature, like, a heavy cavalry called catarfacti. Oh, yeah. They're basically heavily armoured mounted cavalrymen and in order to stop an uprising the Roman dispersed the Sarmatian knights quote unquote heavy cavalry across the empire as auxiliaries and that we think the notion of King Arthur the legend of his knights comes from the Roman centurion Arturius who may or may not have existed living in Roman Britain after the withdrawal with some auxiliary Sarmatian knights really heavily armoured really skilled fighting horsemen that he's basically imported from Sarmatia after the withdrawal from Britain. Is it plausible? Eh, is it likely? Eh, I know the sprite very much disagrees, so I'll let her Excuse talk about this. Excuse me. Do not put words in my mouth. I have one question for you, Bard. What is the 
only contemporary record we have of Arthur. I don't think we had any. I, hon I honestly don't know, but I'd be fascinated to learn, Sprite. So we have records of some monks describing Arthur as the enemy of God, but they describe Warlord Arthur, enemy of God. I also want to interrupt briefly to see that the snake has given us troops in return for his ale, so we have these yellow troops here, which are, again, so many spearmen and, and yeah. archers, but uh, we can command them just as much as we do our own. Continue. So anyway, sorry, you, that you, is, you disagree about my Sarmatian no, right. horseman theory. So my, my, my main question with assuming he's Roman is... Romans didn't really fight on horseback, and yes, I agree. Most like the, the most likely thing we have for Arthur was he was um, a mounted um, warrior. It would explain all the knightly stuff, certainly. Yes. Well, no, that is all written like six hundred um, years after him, so that's oh, all invented. Way, way after. That is completely invented contemporary to like twelve hundred. Ah, you were talking about these earlier, about shields, um, which are there to protect infantry from range attacks. Oh, like wick wicker yep. shields or yeah. wooden no, shields? No, not anymore. Because <laughs> they work against uh, uh, arrows, not against infantry. Right. My spearmen have all died, but we've crucially taken out the siege engines and most of their archers. So, frankly, it's the snake's archers here on this little thing, and they'll die fairly easily, and then they'll be in range of my actual archers. Yeah. Continue. So, yeah, that that's my one thing is, if we're going to say he's Roman, that's a bit... Mm. It is a stretch. It's a big it's stretch. It's a big stretch. I, I don't buy the Roman element, but again, I am very heavily influenced by Bernard Cornwell. So that is an issue, but he did deliberately do loads of research. He is a historical fiction author. Well, he is an actual academic. His, he's an academic. He's an academic historian. Yeah. But he also he's writes wrote, yeah, historical he wrote, fiction. He wrote sharp. Yeah. Yeah. And I have a lot of time for historical fiction because there's lots of things we don't know. So it's like, well, put together a story that people can relate to. I like that. I like my Philippa Gregory's. I like my Bird of Cornwall's. As long as they're well researched. To be researched. fair, Cornwell is like very well researched. So like Cornwell. for the Sharp novel, sorry, my apologies. I've only read a couple of the Sharp novels, but like I did some research around them. And apparently he would go to the battle sites in in Spain, in Portugal, in France, in Belgium. And he would like take a tape measure and he would actually work out. So if Sharp was here... How, how many paces was it from this corner to that corner? And like, if he was... Oh. We're still here. Keep talking. Oh, we're still here. Okay. Oh, sorry. You went silent for a second. No, it wraps attention, And it was oh, terrifying thank you. Thank to think you, that the doctor was being silent, but it can happen. But yeah, like, that's what we would do. He would like literally map out, like, Sharp's got to take 10 paces from that corner to that corner. And like, from this farmhouse that has been preserved, like, could he see the French scouts on the corner of that peninsula or the, the, the copse of that little wood over there? And like, he really, really spent a lot of time doing these. And I know that Sharp is a fictional character. He, he embeds him in like an actual historical conflict pretty well, I think. Yeah. And I, I love that he took that level of detail. So I didn't know he wrote medieval fiction. That's very cool. He writes the Warlord Chronicles. Does he actually? Yes. I don't think I knew that. You failed to mention I that. I definitely mentioned that, but it may have gone missed. But yes. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, we'll wrap up this episode here because it's been a bit of a longer one. Oh, yeah. um, but that was a relatively straightforward mission of like this. That was the nice blend of like the economic and the thing where you like this is a nice thing it does. Like sometimes you're trying to do military stuff, but there I had a purely economical goal: produce twenty ale. But you're under constant ratty thorn in your side. It's it's a nice balance this game strikes. I think. 100%. I, I'm, I'm having such a good time with this viewership. We hope you're enjoying it. If you are, like, share, subscribe, and also comment, because we notice the videos that get more comments also get more views and vice versa. So please, please do comment. Also, the bard loves it when you comment. I was going to say, I, I usually get, us telling us how excited he I is. usually give a disclaimer saying we read every comment even if we don't reply to them, but this prick does reply to all of them. <laughs> so. I, I, I actually do. Like, I've got my, my YouTube synced up in such a way that, like, if you comment, I will see it and I will, I promise you I will reply. I should, I probably should just give you the keys to the gentleman account at some point. That would be far smoother of a process. Than oh, the, the, the literal keys to the kingdom. <laughs> anyway, oh, oh, on the note of my ascension viewership, I will bid you, I will bid you good night and We'll see you very soon. Good day. Good day.